Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this whole day. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Kieran Herbert. Kieran is a storyteller giving voice to people for bikes, better bike share partnership and programming while maintaining a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. This workshop will offer you a glimpse into the gendered barriers to bicycling, some physical, other societal or culture. And with that, take it away, Kieran. Yay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Kieran. I, uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and today I'm beaming in from stolen Ute territory uh, in what is now known as Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and as Sarah said, in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about barriers to biking um, for American Women X. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at several research studies, personal stories um, to look at, to kind of get a holistic picture of the factors that are keeping a lot of people from getting on a bike. So, first, we're gonna talk about the state of riding in the US and you'll notice this chart over here, which is from one of the studies I'm going to dive into a bit more. Um, there's a lot of data going on, but you can kind of take it in as I speak. But the gist of it is even at our best in the US, we're pretty bad. Um, in a comprehensive analysis of travel surveys from 11 countries, which is what this graph is showing over here, a uh, team of researchers found that the US ranked second last for both cycling mode share overall and for cycling mode share specifically among women identified riders. So Americans of all genders travel for bike for just 1.1% of trips. Um, and American women choose the two wheeled option for just 0.6 of theirs. So these numbers really pale in comparison to the top ranking country in the studies, the Netherlands up here, where women take 28% of bikes. So that's 0.6 versus 28%. There's a huge difference there. Um, additionally, in the US, only about a quarter of cycling trips are made by women. Oh, in European countries like the Netherlands or Denmark or Germany, the gender splits more 50-50. Um, and in a lot of instances, actually, it skews female. So there's some big differences. And even in our city uh, with the highest share of women riders, which is New York City, uh, we see 66% male ridership. And that's particularly crazy when you think about it because New York City has 400,000 more women than men. And this is true for recreational riders and bike commuters in the US, most are men. And um, again, I said women make up a quarter of uh, commuting trips. And we'll talk about this a little later, but most of the data we have is on commuting trips, especially in the US. A People for Bikes study um, on recreational found riders found that the split's a little better, 56% male, 44% female, um, which feels a little more true anecdotally, at least for me, but you know, there's still not parity there. So going back to this study, what they really found is that um, there's a gender parity threshold of 7%. And so what that means is at a country level, 7% of all trips, when 7% of all trips are made by bike, um, that's the tipping point. So that's when you reach gender parity, when you have 50%. Um, and so that's been reached in the Netherlands, Japan, Germany, Finland, Switzerland, basically everything kind of in this top quadrant up here. And so um, again, for context, about 1% of all trips in the US are made by bike. So if we got to 7%, we'd hit that parity. That's what the study's really saying. So that's an argument for um, countries to invest in 10 minute cities and where you know all your essential services are in a bikeable distance um, and to have better infrastructure because both those things increase bicycling mode share. And as mode share increases, more women start biking. Um, Japan is also high on here and we can talk about Japan later um, in the question round if you want, it's a bit of an outlier. Um, in the U.S., we think of biking, bicycling advocacy as a gender neutral term that's synonymous with protecting people from on bikes from traffic violence, but it's really not. Um, we know that women have really unique transportation needs. We're going to talk about those a little later um, that shape their experience. And it's not just about safety from drivers. Um, 
women really experience the world differently. And so uh, bicycle advocacy traditionally doesn't account for that. It really focuses on um, recreational riders and commuters, and it doesn't account for the women who are doing a large chunk of the household labor, who are more likely to take shorter trips by bike um, and travel for reasons that are not recreational and they're also not related to work. And so they often get discounted in the conversation. The pandemic does offer a bit of a silver lining for all of this stuff. Um, it's been good for female riding stateside. Data from bicycling app Strava shows that more US women than ever are uploading rides, um, which would take with a grain of salt because it really just means more women are using Strava. But in 2020, women uploaded 47% more bike rides than they did in 2019. And in New York City, the number used number of women using the app increased by 82% over the previous year. And so that's a trend that holds across major cities. Um, and a 2020 People for Bike study of bicycle participation found that during the pandemic, new riders were actually evenly split, male or female. So pandemic's giving us a little hope. And also giving us a hope is the fact that people are kind of starting to recognize this issue. Um, the fact that this presentation is happening, that um, I've been invited to speak on it, that I think as people are becoming more woke to social justice issues in general, um, that gives me hope. But I think old companies are also realizing that there's money to be made here. Like if you want to raise bicycling, you have to get more women involved. And they're trying to figure out the ways to do that. Um, and cities are also realizing that from a climate action standpoint, it's important to engage everyone, to get them on bikes. Um, it's hard to address the issue though, if we don't fully understand it. And a lot of that has to do, our understanding has to do um, with data bias. So this is a book I really love to recommend to people. It's called Invisible Women. Maybe some of you have read it. If you haven't, it's very readable. Um, everybody I've suggested read it has really enjoyed it and it'll really, uh, it really influenced your whole worldview, but particularly um, in transportation. You know, it gives a lot of food for thought on the hidden gender bias in transportation decision making. Um, and this often stems from a lack of data we collect on women at all. So, for example, by not collecting data on women's travel patterns and only on those commuting, it just tells an incomplete story. So that's the hidden data bias. And this is likewise true for gender non binary people. And I apologize in this presentation, I speak a lot to the data around women and female riders because there just isn't data that count for gender non-binary people. Um, and really anyone that doesn't conform to masculine stereotypes are gonna have a harder time interacting in any built environment. Um, one of the big problems with the way we've laid out cities is that they've been laid out to serve the needs of this mythical male breadwinner has a wife at home in the suburbs and drives away to go to work. So in this view, home is a place of leisure. So you don't have a lot of services around your house. And we see this in the suburbs all the time, right? You just, you just have a residential area. Um, and it's kind of based on this idea that you just go home to sleep. And it's completely untrue of how women and people in general, but particularly women live their lives. Um, it can also make things really isolating and limit the mobility and freedom of women. Um, in the US and really most countries, the architecture profession is largely male and white. And that results in a design approach that privileges the male perspective. You know, and this includes like licensing regimes that favor um, heterosexual bars, like male drinking establishments, to parks and sports facilities that are built for boys. Um, so we see a lot of assumptions about who the built environment should serve. And that all contributes to how it's designed. So I really encourage you guys next time you're out, um, out in the world to just think about how it might be built differently if it was designed, if a woman had designed it. Um, and I think about this all the time when I am biking in my hometown of Boulder. Um, we have a lot of bike paths. We're really lucky in that sense, but a lot of them, a lot of the tunnels are not lit at all. And they're very narrow turns. Um, and I think about if I had designed this, it, I would just never have a steep turn like that. I would have lights in the tunnel. So it's a good exercise for us all to think about. Um, 
transportation engineers are also overwhelmingly white and men. Um, and they've long held up work commuting as the standard by which to base planning decisions. So, so much of our data is based on work commuting. And when we know that women are doing a lot of the unpaid labor, this just doesn't account for them at all. Um, and so they're not getting, and if we're basing our planning decisions on computing, commuting, it's just discounting the experience of women. Um, and women actually make more trips than men daily, um, which is an interesting fact, right? They commute shorter distances than on average. So um, they spend about 31 less time, 31% less time commuting than men, but they're, uh, they're responsible for more trips. So, and more of those are retail trips. So US transfer planning for ages has privileged long trips over short. And we see this really in the way we've funded highway expansion and the amount of money we give to projects like that. So we're really supporting a world where people have to drive far and that's how we're investing. That's where we're putting money. Um, and we're doing that over, we're funding those projects over small scale projects that facilitate safer, faster, shorter distance travel. And one of the ways we can kind of um, mediate all this is with gender balanced budgeting, um, which is really where we account for some of these issues and we reallocate money. So how that would look would be like, you know, not funding highways to giving parity to pedestrians and, um, and bicycles. But uh, in some other countries, they have attempted to do this. In Sweden, um, Sweden's one example they talk that um, Caroline Perez talks about in the book, uh, where they've used this framework to change how they snow plowed. And so instead of focusing on those longer uh, commuting routes, they started focusing on the neighborhood routes and plowing those first. And what happened was that it significantly reduced injuries from falls. So there was a lot of, that, that, that's a big win um, in that sense. And why is it all important? Why is all this, like, what, what does this teach us? Um, well, there's a need in America for women to engage more in the paid labor force, especially in marginalized communities. This is something that's important for our economy to grow. Um, but the way our transportation system is currently set up just makes it really difficult. And since women have a harder time taking care of their unpaid care work, it makes it difficult for them to then engage in paid work. Um, Research also shows that when communities make transportation choices that successfully encourage women to ride, everyone comes out to join them. And when they don't, most folks stick to driving. Um, and so I know our mission at People for Bikes, I know you guys probably wanna see this world too, uh, that if we want to get more people on bikes, getting more women to ride is really the key to transforming our society. Okay. And then this, this, this fine fellow right here is Charles Brown. And Charles is a researcher at Rutgers State Uni um, at the Transportation Institute there. And he also runs his own consulting forum called Equitable Cities. And Charles is somebody I work with a lot at People for Bikes. We contract a lot. Um, and he did a study called Breaking Down Barriers to Biking, which over the course of two years worked in 10 cities across the US. Um, to figure out what were some of the factors that were preventing people from getting on bikes. And it was, it was an interesting study in that it was qualitative too. So the participants were really encouraged to lead the discussion. And as he and I have gone through this research, there are a couple of things that stood out. And one of the things was just how some of these barriers are very specific to women. So we're going to run through those now. Um, bicycling is for boys. This is something that almost participants coast to coast mentioned. Um, and this is a quote from Charles. He says, across the board, women were more likely to say that their family members, friends, and others felt that bicycling was much more so for boys and not so much for them. So and Charles heard that more so minority women. Um, and we'll come back to these points, but that's the main thing. Marketing is also a major factor um, Brown and his team identified that 
when it came to societal influences preventing women from bicycling, marketing was really tops. Um, so in particular, that's the way we market. Marketing materials tend to res represent women as a shero or an above average female hero. So often clad in spandex and other technical gear instead of photos of mothers bicycling with their kids to work or school or the grocery store, promotional materials often depict a road cyclist riding for recreation. Um, and more often than not, these women are portrayed will be stereotypically fit and white. Um, plus, I just wanna add like a lot of bike shops have a very bro-like culture and that's something we heard. Uh, it's just not a very welcoming environment for women. So this image of the Shiro is really a female cyclist um, who is great. It's great in terms of boosting the confidence of women, but it makes cycling appear out of reach. Like to be able to cycle, to want to cycle, you have to be able to take on this insurmountable surmountable task. Um, and male participants in the study, like we found that this image of the Shiro also affects them. Um, when they were responding to what they thought a female bicyclist, they reiterated that they thought women had to be independent and confident to be able to bike in public. So for women who don't see themselves as exceptional or simply have less confidence or don't, are just new to the bicycling space, riding becomes all the less accessible. Um, in terms of cultural barriers, something that repeatedly emerged in Brown's research in this study, but also in two others he did, uh, among Hispanic female respondents was the perception of bicycling as a sexualized activity. Um, and this is a quote from Brown, but women have said that they were prevented from riding bicycles as a young girl because they were deemed to be promiscuous. And that had to do um, with the association of women's, basically the proximity to the seat. So I'll let you guys um, extrapolate on that. So in a way, like these young girls, they were shamed for riding because they didn't want to appear as sexually active. And again, this is primarily something Charles was hearing in the Hispanic community. Um, traditionally female clothes limit mobility. That's just true. We probably have all experienced that. If you want to bike in a skirt, high heels, um, it can limit your ability to walk comfortably, but let alone bike comfortably. Um, and it can also be especially problematic when it's a requirement for women to look in a certain manner that men deem professional in the workspace. Um, just appearance in general is a big barrier for women. For black women in particular, if you have relaxed hair, anything that involves sweating or getting caught in the rain is just off the table, so biking. For those that wear their hair natural in braids, dreadlocks, or afros, helmet sizes can be problematic. Um, and Brown's research respondents also shared that as women, particularly, again, minority women, showing up to work sweaty would be an issue. Um, as one female participant indicated, there's a big gender element to presentation. Men can show up a little sweaty, it's kind of okay. There's definitely a, an element of women needing to show up in the professional context looking pretty much perfect. Um, so this is a great plug for kind of e-bikes, which eliminate that issue somewhat, uh, but it's still, there's an unfair um, onus placed on women to look a certain way. And that appearance can also actually discourage helmet use. So religion is another barrier for some women, um, depending on certain sex that are very gendered, uh, bicycling is often seen as the thing that again is for men. Um, but in the context of this study, while Charles was connecting his focus group in Portland, Oregon, um, which is my hometown and a place that we often think of as a really bicycling friendly uh, city, what Charles would say is, you know, when we say that, who's it friendly for? Because it's certainly not friendly for the group, uh, the Muslim family that he interviewed for the study. Um, and in, with that family, what he heard from all members, from men and women, was that bicycling was more dangerous for the female members, not because bicycling went against Islam in any way, but because they believed US society at large perceived hijab wearing Muslim women to be weaker and thus an easy target. So just, just take that in for a second. It's really this, um, it's this idea that 
in a country that's pretty racist, if you were already feel targeted as, um, as a Muslim, somebody who's the hijab identifies you, or, you know, I think a lot of our, of Asian American women right now, um, who, and all the racism surrounding that, like you can just feel like a target when you're on a bike um, and that can feel really unsafe. Um, and so this feeling of safety, it exists on a spectrum. Um, stereotypes are only further exacerbated by the difficulty women have riding in skirts or dresses, but also like as the cat calling so many of us have experienced. Um, in Memphis, during the study, um, many of the respondents noted harassment as a, their chief concern to bicycling. One expressed a sense of envy that male bicyclists feel comfortable enough to ride and feel safe. That was something she just couldn't comprehend, feeling safe to ride. Um, and you know, it just, it just, it does exist on a spectrum. Um, well, what may seem harmless to one woman, like a whistle, um, can seem really dangerous to another, especially if that whistle is coming from somebody in a pickup truck, which can be weaponized. Um, and if you're somebody who has a history of sexual assault, like it might be even scarier. Infrastructure, of course, has a big role to play here. Protected bike lanes are known to produce more gender parity. Um, but in the US, we were actually really behind on getting bike lanes and we still are. Um, but where we do see high quality bike infrastructure, this gap just doesn't really exist. Um, so making streets safer increases female use dramatically. That's just a huge, huge thing. Um, and another safety element in terms of infrastructure is, uh, in addition to protected bike lanes, is just the importance of things like LED lights for nighttime travel. Um, when you think about it, catcalling just becomes a lot scarier when you're alone at night on an unprotected and unlit bike path and you don't speak English. So um, as with all the barriers I'm really talking about here, some affect some women more than others. And these are just some photos I pulled from the internet. They're examples of the Shiro. And I really just Googled in an image search, women bicycling. And these are what showed up. And I, I chose them because the titles are also just a little ironic, right? Ways to make riding a bike more comfortable, women only cycling issues. Um, these are all white women, clad in spandex, riding road bikes. Um, and they're all kind of looking pretty intense here, right? Like if I'm somebody who has never thought of biking for, as something for me, I've been told biking is for boys, like this isn't helping. Um, and it's just making it seem like there's something, like I have to be in shape, I have to have all the right gear, in order to even get on a bike in the first place. So just really encourage you guys when you are out there to um, out in the world <laughs> to really take note of this, these images and just look at things with a more critical eye, like the images that you're posting, that you're consuming um, just across the board. See how often this image of the Shiro pops up. And I'll say that even recently with this, with the push, the social justice push we've been seeing, um, to get more black and brown bodies in marketing, we're just seeing the Shiro image transferred onto black bodies. Um, so just, just keep an eye out for that. Intersectionality, <laughs> what is it? So intersectionality is this analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. Perhaps you guys are familiar with the term, it's really, you know, how there can be overlapping systems of oppression. Um, it was coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw and it has to do with your race, your ethnicity, your religion, socioeconomic status, education, body type, all these things, um, this fun chart. So it's really like, you know, maybe you're a woman, but so you, you, have, you have your gender, but then you're also a black woman and you're an older black woman and you're also gay. And you know, maybe you're also ha have a bit of, have a disability. So there are there are compounding things that um, that can affect your experience and how you interact with this world. And so a lot of us at this conference, um, I'm just making an assumption here. So 
forgive me, but a lot of us probably have a lot of privilege. Um, like, did you learn to ride a bike as a child? Did you always have a bike? Um, did no one ever tell you that biking was for boys? Uh, have you never had to deal with appearance issues at your places of work? Um, I know for me, all those things are true. Um, and so it's just important to check our privilege, to remember that when we're talking about um, solutions, there's no one blanket solution that works for women because we are all these things. Um, and this is something the feminist movement has really, you know, gotten a lot of slack for in the past, flack for in the past, because um, when you just have one, one blanket viewpoint that is tends to be the white female viewpoint, because white females are those with the most privilege, it really discounts others and it really prohibits change. And so this is Roshan Austin, um, amazing human. She lives in Memphis, uh, Tennessee and works as a community organizer there. Um, and Memphis, and I'm, I'm using the, the story of Roshan because it really just brings a lot of these points together. Um, Roshan is somebody who grew up really poor and in a very religious household. Um, she grew up holiness Pentecostal and all the things on this page are quotes directly from her. Um, but in her tradition, whistling was considered sinful, as was skipping. Like she wasn't even allowed to wear pants. So riding a bike, that was just something that girls did not do. Um, and so, you know, even like her dad eventually got sick um, and she, when she was 10. So she had a lot, gone a lot more responsibility from a very young age. Um, she just never got to be a kid. So even if biking was something that was acceptable for women in her culture, it wasn't something she even had time to dream of. Um, she was too preoccupied getting dinner on the table, taking care of her siblings. And um, biking was just not even on her radar. Um, and there was also the fact that in her neighborhood where she grew up, um, biking was something that was associated with kind of like a lower class individual, those that maybe were involved in drugs, um, and in the African-American community, especially in low-income communities, um, the automobile was really venerated. It was a thing that had, sh that showed you were successful, that showed you arrived. Um, so if you were biking, that was just something that was associated with, um, with somebody you maybe didn't want to be. Um, and you never, she never saw women riding a bike, um. She said as she got older, she started to see um, and would travel a bit more outside of her neighborhood, um, which she would do by bus. Um, she saw more white men and spandex on road bikes. And then she, she got a scholarship to Middlebury, um, which is a school in Vermont, in rural Vermont, um, very wealthy school, um, very white school. And she started to see people on mountain bikes there. Um, which we all know are very expensive. Um, so she, she still wasn't feeling like biking was for her. She moved back to Memphis to, um, to work as a community organizer. And she started, bike shares came on the scene and she started to promote bike share as something in her community that would help, um, help with equity, help with mobility issues. But even at that point, when she was promoting bike share for others, she wasn't thinking of biking as something for her. She wasn't learning to ride a bike. Um, she really just didn't have any interest. And I can really relate to this as we get older, you know, things that you typically learn as children can become harder. Like I didn't learn to ski till I was 26. And so I can just say there's like a lot of fear around anything that involves the body, the older you get, um, fear of getting hurt. And so people for bikes, where I work um, in normal times or pre-COVID times run, ran bike study trips where we would fund a group of individuals to go look at biking in a different um, country. And one of our trips was to Amsterdam and Roshan um, was invited to go. And that was the first time that, that she was ever like, oh, wait, I'm gonna have to learn to bike if I go on this trip. And she wanted to go. so. Um, she still, she still was putting it off a lot and it wasn't until a pre-trip meeting that she met, um, 
a woman named Sylvia Crum who walked in wearing skirt and wedge heels, um, who just didn't look like that stereotypical image we've been talking about. And she said, okay, this woman can teach me how to bike. Um, so she learned a little in Memphis, but by the time she got to Amsterdam, she still wasn't thinking of herself as a bicyclist. Um, it was really her experience in Amsterdam where part of the trip, they went to meet a woman named Mama Agatha, who runs, um, who runs an organization that teaches refugee women in Amsterdam how to bike. And so these women come, they, most of them don't speak Dutch, they don't speak English, they've never been on a bike. They have a lot of the barriers in their lives that we've been talking about. And the experience of seeing them learn and meeting Mama Agatha, who is an old, older black woman, really changed things for Ocean. She finally said, wow, like these women are doing it. Um, they're overcoming these obstacles and like having that form of community really helped her to start thinking of herself as a bicyclist. And I love this photo because it's it's her in Amsterdam on the trip and she just looks so happy. Um, and I will say, I think that learning to really get comfortable biking when you had protected infrastructure like this really helped. Uh, and today, Roshan is obsessed with biking. It's her, she's incredibly busy and it's her form of release. It's the thing she does when she wants to relax. Um, she owns six bikes, one of which is a Peloton. Um, and she, she actually owns a lot of spandex now herself. She's really into biking. Um, and it's just, it's changed her life. It's a huge part of who she is now. So what can be done, right? Like how, how do we get women who grew up in similar positions as Roshan to get on bikes, right? Um, we all have a role to play in this. Um, and specifically, if you work in the bike space and marketing, the images we choose to share on social media um, with articles and newsletters, like it's all really important. Um, and I think even if people for bikes, we, we try not to even use the term cyclist because we think it's a little less inclusive than bicyclist because it kind of plays into that Shiro image. Um, we know that infrastructure, as I talked about, was is the most important thing um, to get people comfortable on bikes, but to get infrastructure, we need government action and female leadership is, is really key here. Um, uh, Paris offers a really great example of all this coming together where they have um, a socialist mayor named Anne Hidalgo. And during COVID, some amazing things happened in Paris um, and that, that really got more women to bike. And what's key about them is that she was very intentional in targeting women. Um, so from March to May, 49% of new subscribers to Villeb, which is the city's bike share system, were women. And that's compared to 40% in the months before. And they think that's because um, Paris laid down 50 kilometers of temporary protected bike lanes within the city um, and 100 kilometers in the suburbs. So the city subsidized electric bike purchases and offered up to 50 euros on bike repairs to all citizens. So they were really trying to reduce a lot of those barriers. But in her bike plan, um, Mayor Hidalgo also included specific requirements for gender equality, um, which created, you know, all those bike lanes and made a lot of them fully protected. And she also made sure that they installed better lighting at night and provided more access to those electric vehicles, um, which, you know, benefits all cyclists, but the focus on safety has a particular significant effect on female cyclists, um, who we know just value it more. Um, there's also an example in, uh, from, in, during COVID times from New York City, where um, during COVID, New York instituted its critical workers program, which made it um, city bike, that, that New York's bike share system free for essential workers. Um, and what they found was because New York's population of healthcare workers and other critical workers like many places in the US is predominantly female, 60% of new signups for city bike were women, which raised the number of female members from 32% to 38%, which so we're not at 50% still, but that's a huge jump, right? That's 6%. Um, and it's the highest proportion since city bike started collecting gender statistics. Um, and one of the things other bike share systems can do is really, um, 
uh, pass out friend, uh, bring a friend vouchers so women can invite their friends to come bike with them and try it out because we know that for women community is key and I think this is such a great lesson for this group because you guys are all obviously in community you have this amazing group in Pittsburgh um, coming together and showing solidarity like right we find safety in numbers so inviting people in and finding ways to be inclusive in your community gatherings is so important um, that's why communities like black girls do bike um, and youth organizations like Trips for Kids, GRIT, Little Bellas, um, bicycle education programs for refugees and women. Um, a lot of the work we fund through the Better Bike Share Partnership, like all these things are so important. Um, and Charles Brown, going back to his study, what he, one of his recommendations was really that we create safer spaces for women to, um, to commiserate and be together because social groups are successful because women find comfort in company. Groups promoting sisterhood and cycling are what's needed to keep breaking down barriers. Um, and when we think even to Roshan's story of how she, she felt comfortable learning when it was a woman who didn't fit the stereotypical image was teaching her and then to meet Mama Agatha in this refugee community, that's really where she found her comfort level and was able to get um, to envision herself as a bicyclist. And now um, when she tells her story and when she is in public as a black, older female cyclist, she says it inspires others and it brings more people in. And we also throughout have to remember that intersectionality is key. There's this fun little guide over here that I'm sure you've been looking at as I talk. Um, but it's really about recognizing our privilege. So when I write about some of these issues and when we post them on social media, things like that, maybe in your own mind, you're saying, well, you know, catcalling is not an issue for me. Like, I don't feel unsafe. Like the Shiro image isn't like preventing me from bicycling, right? So we think a lot of terms of our own experience. Um, but we have to check our privilege because we want to make bicycling work for those with the the most barriers because that's when it's going to work for everyone. So just because this isn't your experience doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And for a lot of women, especially women who are in historically marginalized populations, like we don't get to hear their voice. We don't hear their stories. We don't know for the, for the women who are scared, they're most likely not coming up and they're not posting on my Facebook. So it's just important to always keep the the knowledge that as we look at solutions, what works for one group isn't gonna work for another and things really need to be tailored um, to individual communities and to individuals and to be targeted in a way that, that isn't like, this is a blanket solution that's gonna work for all women. No, there's gonna be solutions that need to work for a Hispanic community versus a disabled community, things like that. So what will the end result look like? We, if we get it right, um, what, what's, what's our world, right? So I want everybody to kind of close their eyes and to think about the first time you ever rode a bike. Um, now maybe think about the last time you rode a bike or imagine you're like, after this, after this conference, you're going to get ice cream at Millie's, right? Just like, how do you feel on that bike? Um, how do you feel with the wind in your hair and you're just going down the road. Like, what is it that you get from bicycling, right? I'm sure you probably look a lot like this. You're just happy. Um, bicycling really offers a sense of freedom. That's what it comes down to, right? It's, it's something Roshan com emphasized continuously in my conversations with her. And it's also what we hear from refugees, from kids. Um, it's the freedom like a being able, like in refugee communities, I just interviewed one in Arizona that it's the freedom of being able to go learn English, to being able to assimilate. It's the freedom of being able to go to the grocery store, to leave a bad situation. Um, it's also just the freedom from, for Roshan, at least from stress of your work for I think a lot of us, right? To get out there and decompress. Um, and there's something, you know, our keynote, Ann Nguyen said that really stuck with me in one of her, previous articles, um, she said, biking's about freedom, right? 
It's freedom from being tied to a bus schedule, car payments, static traffic, or confined route. Um, this individual form of transport gives a sense of self-sufficiency and symbolizes liberation from cultural barriers by simply choosing to travel differently. So that's really the point we wanna get at. Um, and to build a better world with more people on bikes. Um, so these are some of the, the sources that I talk about I, that I used in this presentation. If you're interested, you can screenshot this. Highly recommend the book, Invisible Women. Um, this is an article I wrote that kind of combines this first one that combines Charles Brown's research and the story of Roshan, um, and then some other stories here. And then this Black Girls Do Bike one from Pittsburgh, I thought that would be great for you guys to check out locally. Um, and I'll turn it back to Sarah now, uh, who will help moderate questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, I, I saw a couple questions in the chat, um, so I want to hop straight to those. I think the first one I saw was actually from Anne. Um, do you have insight on why women feel so unsafe on bikes? Sometimes I feel like I can physically get away faster from unwanted detention than walking. Mm -hmm. I, I thought about, I've actually thought about this a lot when talking to Charles and this was kind of the, the biking exists on a spectrum thing. Cause I actually mentioned exactly that. I was like, if I'm on a bike, I can like bike away. He was like, yeah, but what if they're in a truck? He was like, then that truck becomes a weapon. And then um, and I think, you know, because our infrastructure is not there in a lot of cities, there's not awareness for drivers, like they're not used to seeing bicyclists, even one close experience of getting hit, um, can be really scary and can turn you off completely. Um, and in so many places, they're just, the infrastructure is not there. So women are either, you know, if they want to bike on sidewalks, they can, but it's, it's just, it's a scary, it's a scary thing to be in that world with cars. Um, but the, the cat calling is, it can kind of go both ways. That's what I realized. I was like, oh, I can get away, but um, then I, I, I personally have been hit by a car. I got hit by a truck. Um, so exactly like, it depends on what your experience is. Yeah, I would definitely second that. Um, you know, depending on experience, Emily in the chat said that um, they're from Portland, but live in Pittsburgh now, and they feel very unsafe riding here because of aggressive drivers. And yeah, it's, I actually started biking myself because it was um, a situation where I didn't own a car and I worked multiple jobs and I, you know, felt safer like biking home than waiting for the bus or walking a longer distance by myself. But um, yeah, that doesn't eradicate the, um, you know, unsafe feelings that can come when you're around aggressive drivers or negate the experiences that some people have had um, while biking. It's just really, really depends on your lived experience. Um, yeah, a lot of people in the chat looks like are or seconding that. Yeah, and I, I feel that, right? And just, so I actually got hit while I was walking. So I wasn't on a bike, but I think what, it, what also is worth noting is that it can be safer than walking. It can feel safer in that sense, but it can still not feel completely safe, right? Like you can still not have adequate lighting. You can still um, have turns where you might like your risk of being robbed might less be less, but then your risk of crashing might be more. So there's there's just a spectrum of safety and it's really about like, we shouldn't have to settle on any of it. Um, speaking of feelings of safety, I did see um, someone, it looks like Angie said, aggressive male bikers in the city, bike lanes are a problem and can be an intimidating presence, I guess. Do you have any tips um, for people who are experiencing um, perhaps not harassment, but just that kind of feelings of intimidation or aggression from other bicyclists? Like get out of the way kind of thing. Um, I mean, it really like biking, if you're, if you're not, if you're feeling that, I'd say 
bike with other people. Like that's one of the big things we can do. And like, it really comes down to like, if you, when you have community, when you feel safe in numbers, like you're, you're going to get more comfortable through that experience. Um, aggressive male cyclists are definitely a thing. They're also, a, they're also who we've, they're also the reason why we are so behind on having protected bike lanes in the U S because vehicular bicyclists were kind of like, that's not necessary. And, um, it's, it's something that's changed in recent years, but, um, is still a big issue. Um, I would, I would also just, if you feel intimidated, I, I think there's a certain amount of like, it's unfortunate, but we do, you shouldn't have to feel like you have to be any other way. Um, you don't have to move for somebody else. They should go around you. Like never feel like you have to yield in that kind of situation. But if you're feeling it a lot, I really think going with other people. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'd say owning your space is key. I think that was one of my biggest struggles when I first started biking was, you know, not, not feeling like I belonged on the road um, because some drivers made me feel that way. Or even if I was in a bike lane, you know, someone was like going around me, <laughs> speeding up a hill. Um, yeah, really owning your space um, and biking with others. That's not just, you know, for, for safety, but also, you know, the more normalized biking is, the more drivers see it, the safer it is for all of us. Um, so yeah, Kat in the chat said, take those lanes, Ian's. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I guess if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, chat us. We are all ears. Yeah. And there's even, if nobody has questions, I can even just talk about um, why Japan in that study was kind of an outlier. Um, that's the thing when I gave this presentation in my work, people were really curious about because Japan doesn't have a lot of great protected bike lanes um, or infrastructure in that sense. Um, but they still have a biking threshold that's around 7%. And people were like, I don't really understand, like, how do we get there? Um, and the way, and the reason why the researchers think that is, is because cities in Japan are really laid out like true 10 or 15 minute cities. So you have a lot of, um, there's, there's smaller streets. So cars are going slower and everything is kind of reachable in a shorter distance. Um, and a lot of women in Japan, when they do have children, um, traditionally stay home. And so they're taking a lot of their trips by bikes because they can, things are close. And so when we build our cities in that in that way where essential services are more accessible, even if the infrastructure is not quite there, more people are gonna bike. So what we really say is like, if Japan had the infrastructure too, biking might be even above some of these other places in Europe. Uh, do you do outreach in other languages or when Charles Brown did a study um, in, in some of those cases, there, if needed, they'll bring in um, a Spanish interpreter or um, in, in the Portland case, they did for the most part speak, speak English, but it, it depends who shows up. Not all the groups were the same size. Um, Charles does a lot of research. So um, he, he it, when he, in those studies with the Hispanic population, there was also um, a Spanish component, but in our studies, um, although outreach was done in multiple languages, it wasn't unless um, there were people who showed up in the final group who needed language assistance. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, the, the studies, they, they look different in every place, um, but people were paid for their time to be there. And um, there was in, in a lot of cases and in Portland, especially like the, the study groups were actually more diverse than the populace of the cities we were in, like the overall. Yeah, that's very cool. I know it's like a lot of logistics once you um, try to put all these languages in and, you know, there's those headsets where it translates in time and stuff like that. But um, cool. I really admire what you do. And I just wanted to say, I can't believe you still do what you do after getting hit by a truck. I just have to like announce that to all the ladies on here and whoever joined. That's power to you. 
that, that happened to me in October. And it's honestly, I, I joined people for bikes in January. It was like a huge made motivator in getting involved in this work and trying to, you know, make our city safer and make people feel more comfortable on the streets and um, to really take them back and make our, our cities more pedestrian focused. Like our, our places should be for people and not for, not for cars. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, yeah, that speaks exactly to our mission and exactly what we're all about at Bike Pittsburgh because it's sometimes it feels hard to imagine <laughs> what streets would be like um, if they were designed for people because we are so used to this really car dominant culture in the US. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And you're doing really, really important work to help change that. So thank you. And thank you for uh, presenting all of your findings here today and sharing those with us. We really appreciate it. I mean, that something you just said, like when we design cities for people, that goes back to what we were talking about, right? If you imagine a world where women are designing it, it would naturally be more designed for people because women are the ones who are stay, who are walking, who are doing these, who are doing their shopping trips, who would rather have things be more accessible and closer to home, who are focused on the safety of our children. Um, and so when we really think about design and reimagining what the built environment would look like if a woman designed it, it really comes down to kind of the vision we all want to see, right? Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> I think it was, yeah, Marley who, who put a job shout out there. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if anyone knows of places that are hiring, um, I'm sure this is a great good group to share that with um, people who are, you know, interested in getting involved in bicycle and pedestrian advocacy work, um, join a local bike ped committee, um, check out the resources that all of our speakers shared today. You know, there are so many fantastic ways for you all to get involved um, or to continue the work that you're already doing on your own. So yes, thank you all so much. Um, I think to wrap it up here, I'm just going to share my slides one more time. Um, I just want to give a huge thank you um, to all of our incredible speakers today. Um, really, this event would not be possible without you, um, our program participants. Thank you all so much for supporting this program and believing in the power of our women non-binary community. Um, major thank you to our presenting sponsor, Dollar Bank, as well as our supporting sponsors, Move Forward, Vibrant Pittsburgh and Nugo. Um, I also want to thank our friends at Machines for Freedom, Superfit Hero, Terry Bicycles, and Poe Campo, who generously donated the merch for our summit giveaways. Um, so keep an eye on your email because we'll be announcing our winners on Monday. Um, and be sure to visit the summit website for our online activities. Um, we have some really cool things on there. Um, Bike Girl Magic ebook by Black Girls Do Bike, some awesome how-to videos and uh, links to other local organizations who are doing this great work. Um, we hope to see you all this afternoon for our group ride to Millie's Ice Cream. We will be meeting at the Highland Park Fountain at 2 p.m. And you can check out the route beforehand on our website where you can also find a code for a free healthy ride rental. Um, if you don't have a bike, you can check one out there. And today's ride will be led by Donna Bivens of Black Girls Do Bike, and we'll also be joined by Cassandra Leopold, the city's principal planner, who will be giving us a mini tour of the bike-friendly infrastructure that was installed as part of Move Forward. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Um, that's, that's everything in a nutshell, I feel like. <laughs> um, thank you all for making this such an incredible event, like every single year. Um, you show up and you make it wonderful. I hope we can all be here in person together <laughs> next year and continue this magic. Um, yeah, we hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.